What's up, everybody? All right, let's go. How are we doing? There's a connection tonight. Wow, it's pretty dark. All right, what's up, everybody? It's, um, yeah, it's Monday night. I uh, just thought I would do a um, kind of a, this one's gonna, this one's kind of winging it. We're kind of doing this one impromptu. So, in light of recent events, yeah, let's see. Am I going here? Am I going? There, and I am connected. All right, there we go. All right, what's going on, everybody? Yeah, in light of recent events, uh, um, I thought I would uh, pop on here and discuss some of the interesting things that happened in the last um, 24 hours. Um, we've been gone for about a week now, um, almost a week. Well, we've done a couple of things. We've done an Insta Live and some other things, but um, you know, a lot of stuff going on in the world. What's up, everybody? A lot of stuff going on, um, so I uh, can't always uh, pop on here every night. But you know what? We did um, about two weeks, about three weeks of constant um, daily streams uh, to get it going. And I'm glad we did that because it turns out, you know, when something when something occurs, when something happens, we sort of established that, um, you know, we, we, um, we had a routine going. But don't worry, folks. We're going to get back to that. Uh, we just had a lot going on, um, which I'm not going to get into. But you know what? Suffice it to say, uh, life is going on and we live in, right? L-I-V-I-N. And before we get going tonight, why don't we um, – why don't I uh, say a couple of things? I'll reach out to some of my homies here. We got celebrations out there in the world. There's not It's not all bad. There's some good things happening. Uh, shout out to my homie Jerry on uh, Exposing Powerful Lies, live streams. He's got some good news. Um, he's uh, – he, uh, well, I won't, I won't give too many details, but he's got some good news. Um, so, um, go to his channel and, uh, you can communicate with him online. Um, and it's probably the best news we can get. Um, we also want to say, uh, uh, shouts out and prayers, um, for our, uh, our home girl, Ellie, for sure. Um, and shout out to everybody out there who's, um, there's a lot going on out in the world, y'all. And, you know, I'd love to be able to mention specific things, but, um, we come here to um, talk about talk about literature and stuff. So you know, maybe you want to come here to get away from it all. So um, let's let's keep it rolling. I'm not trying to minimize anything, but you know, um, you know, when you read a lot of literature and when you when you're into the arts and all this stuff, um, you can be, you know, you can be a sensitive soul, right? So you know, um, I should I'll leave it there. Uh, let's just talk about. Uh, what happened last night? You guys watched the uh, the big ritual, right? What do you guys think? I will say, especially if you're watching this later, you know might not know what I'm referring to, but I'm referring to the um, the big Hollywood ritual, right? The Oscars, and because we're you know I'm not going to get too much into uh, film analysis or current events. It's not really our our area right here. But remember, we have talked about before the landscape of literature and how. Um, you know, this stuff concerns us, right? We're also talking about, you know, finding truth um, in literature, in words and worldviews. And uh, especially when we're talking about uh, things like movies, I mean, you know, this is, this is the current, this is the, not the new artistic medium, but you know, this is the written word. So we might as well talk about um, some of the things that go along with it. So if you watch the, uh, the Oscars last night, which I did, I watched, by the way, um, people, you know, People, uh, in my, my homeboys know, um, yeah, that I watched the entire thing. And um, a lot of people will say, like, how do you, how do you, you know, how can you bear to watch this? Well, yeah, I, I feel you on that. However, like, I've probably watched, I don't know, every um, Oscar ceremony since, uh, I don't know, the 90s. I don't know. I, I just, I always, like, I love movies. And especially back in the 90s and stuff when I was a teenager, I just loved it. You know, probably the highlight was um, the highlight of watching like the Oscars was uh, when I was in drama school. There goes the dog. When I was in drama school, and uh, Daniel Day Lewis, who went to our school, um, my itchy nose, um, went to our school, and he was nominated for um, Gangs of New York, and we watched that. We, you know, everybody at school. Of course, they always say with this stuff. By the way, that like they'll say with the sports ball and stuff, they'll be like. Um, you know, people around the world, you know, there's like 300 million people tuned into this. Everyone's watching it around the world. But anybody, any of you guys who are watching, you know, who are on here from 
uh, anywhere that's not America, you know that uh, it's kind of BS because it airs in the middle of the night, right? There's only so many people watching, and it's uh, and it lasts forever. And of course, this year's ceremony was a little different, right? Because it was um, a continue. You know, it's like they're trying to get back into the swing of it after the events of the past two years. The last two years were kind of a wash, right? Who can even name any of the films, right? Um, and yes, Daniel Day Lewis. Uh, um, uh, let's see, isn't a familiar name tied to a character in that movie? Well, Gangs of New York is um, a Martin Scorsese film, and it's uh, Leo, Liam Neeson. Actually, so Daniel Day Lewis went to my drama school, and then Liam Neeson went to where I went to university. So it was interesting watching that film. He didn't win for it. I, you know, I, I wanted him to win. Obviously, he later won. Um, he's won three times. Um, and we could talk about, you know, winning and all that stuff and, you know, what that means. <laughs> and, uh, oh, TGF, thank you so much, sir. I appreciate you, homeboy. Um, yes, thank you, TGF, for um, dropping me a fat PayPal. Uh, I really appreciate it. Man, you are you are a true Kang, and I love you so much. Um, yeah, you guys, uh, if you see the links there, or um, they're in the description, and then they're in the channel description. Um Thank you so much, buddy. I love you so much. Appreciate you. Um, yes, yeah, support the channel. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you, homeboy. Thank you so much for that. Um, TGF also, Nick also um, supporting tonight. Um, uh, DPH, um, David Patrick Carey at Church of the Eternal Logos. Great stream as always, man. He's been killing it lately. So, yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you. Um, to everybody who supported me, I really appreciate you. Uh, did did uh, the Z Man win an Oscar? No, he did not. Which is um, I so I'm not I'm not bragging, folks. But my superpower is kind of I don't know. I'm really good. At, I should put some money on this, but I'm really good at um, at uh, predicting who will win um, the Oscars and who should win. Right? Um, it's kind of two separate categories, and I'm pretty like I'm pretty. You know, I'm not. You know. I'm not all all dubs, but um, over the years. But then again, it's not. I mean, how hard is it to tell? I think the difference is like knowing who will win is like who will win according to the rules of how they win. OK, so, you know, if you're if you're first of all, the Oscars for us, they don't mean it. who cares. Right. Um, who cares about any of this? I would say that. You know, it's obviously not a judge of the best film. Maybe at one time it was, right? But in a way, like for an actor, you know, it can it can kill your career. Uh, there have been a lot of actors and actresses who um, it's a, you know, it's kind of not a curse, but it, you know, kind of kills their career. Uh, the best thing to win as an actor is the best supporting actor. Um, that's the best Oscar to win. Because those, when you look at who's won in the past, you get all the best actors um, that are in the, you know, working in the industry and they continue to work. Uh, but, you know, you never get, you rarely get like actually great actors. You get, you know, Hollywood people. Let's say J.K. Simmons is like a example, is like a, um, an exception to that. The guy who won for um, uh, the drama movie, what's it called? Um, Whiplash. Yeah, that guy was a character actor for like years, right? And um, then he won for that role. And that role is perfect because that role is um, it's about, you know, the uh, training in a, you know, in, a, in a, a school of music in New York, which is the equivalent of like, you know, it's basically Juilliard. And that, you know, just from experience, that movie is exactly on point. That is how you are trained. Um, his character in that is exactly like someone who uh, I had the pleasure of being trained by for two years. Exactly. Um, you know, not probably not towards the end, like not as psychotic, um, obviously, but like for all of the rest of it, yeah, very, very much. That's, that's the way is that, that movie really got it. Another thing about the Oscars before I get into this is they always do this thing. If you notice where, um, they miss the mark on like a, a, a movie that sort of changes the industry. Uh, that's me. And, uh, and then they try to make up for it, like with the next year. So for instance, um, like, you remember that movie Moulin Rouge, right? The Boz Lerman movie, which I, I'm not like a fan of the movie. I don't like the movie, but it was huge. I mean, it really, it brought back like musicals into Hollywood and it was like inventive, you know, and it's Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman. And that movie didn't get anything 
So then what did they do? They gave it the next time there was a musical to Chicago, which is, you know, it's an old musical. It's not very good, but they were trying to make up for it. They also missed it with uh, Whiplash. So then they gave it to the guy's next movie, which was La La Land. They, they always continuously do this. And so you can always judge by like, um, you know, who's going to win by like how they miss the mark. Right. Um, so this year, right. Uh, there were a couple of things that happened. Um, first of all, I watched like the whole thing, including the, the, we know that the Oscars is a, essentially, you know, it's a ritual. All, it's like all aspects of a ritual. It's a, we could go into that and like, we could go into some of the elements, right? The pyramids, the stage, the, the gold statue, all this stuff. But we know also that, you know, it serves a, it serves a bunch of different functions. And um, do you guys know how you, supposedly win an Oscar. Do you know this? You win an Oscar by um, being voted on by the Academy. So you have to be a member of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, right? Um, and so there's like, there's a Screen Actors Guild. There's a few of them. And when you vote, basically what you do, like if you're a member of the Screen Actors Guild, what happens is you basically get sent like, you know, it's probably now it's a lot more digital, but like hard copies of all the films before they even come out a lot of times. Um, and they have to, you know, they watch those and then they have to sort of give them back to I don't know, their agent or the, or the studio or whoever, but their sort of job is to watch the films so that they can vote accurately on it. But what happens is inevitably a lot of people, you know, that a lot of people in Hollywood um, in the industry, like don't actually watch films. And we, you know, we see this every year, like in the, in the, um, in the war, it's like where they always do these things. They're like, we love telling stories and we love watching stories. And that's probably true. But um, it's also like they don't they just don't watch the films. Um, not not necessarily because they don't you know like them or want to. It's just, you know, a lot of people don't have time or whatever. There are some people, I'm sure, who watch every single film ever. I mean, we Scorsese, I'm sure, does that. Um, Tarantino does that. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson does that probably. But most people like don't. And so the, who they end up voting for is um, they vote for like the people that you would assume to win or that like they have the most buzz about or they're owed something or, um, you know, or uh, or a lot of times like we found out that um, a lot of people will lobby to win. Right. People will take out full page ads just to win the award. I think Sharon Stone was the last person I'm aware of that sort of got in trouble for that. She like gave out Rolex watches to all these people so that she could win because it would boost her career. Um, so this time, um, I mean, I'd seen uh, Belfast and I'd seen, I don't know, only a couple of the movies, which is weird because I mean, the movies are kind of dead, right? I don't know if you agree with me, but you know, movies, Hollywood is like, it's just so broken and there's hardly anything a uh, new original that comes out and uh, for so many reasons and all this stuff. But I, I this is the first year I can remember where I didn't see hardly any of the films, even though I, my predictions were right for this thing. Um, but I knew that uh, Will Smith would win best actor because um, when you watch the ceremony last night, um, the first thing they showed was like the music, um, the Beyonce, like live music from um, Compton where they were like, it was a tennis court. Right. And, he was up for this tennis movie where he plays the um, Venus twins dad. And then he was like right up near the front. They constantly were making mention of him. And then the big event happened. And that was obviously because he was going to be the way the big winner. And he was, um, I, I gotta say, I saw, I kind of did and didn't see Kenneth Branagh winning for best uh, screenplay for Belfast. I thought he probably a lot of times you'll win like best screenplay. If you're not winning anything else, I knew nightmare alley wouldn't, wouldn't, walk away with anything because Guillermo del Toro, del Toro won for um, the, was it the weight of water just like not too long ago. And so his directing style is like, it's kind of too, too similar. Um, and I kind of figured Dune wouldn't pick up much. Um, it's too big of a movie. Right. Um, and so they, I don't know. Yeah. Nightmare Alley. I liked Nightmare Alley a lot. Um, that's probably the reason why I didn't get it. Cause it's too, it was too sort of focused and esoteric. It wasn't uh, big enough or it didn't have enough of a political message or whatever it was. Um, the uh, Sean Penn, um, the Sean Penn thing was obviously just lunacy. Um, he's not going to do that. And it's such, 
I don't know. We could, that's like a whole other thing to talk about, right? Um, they did, though, do a couple of, you know, uh, statements about the thing that's happening, right? Um, stand with the place. They did a whole commercial. I was surprised that um, some of the people chosen, like, didn't do more about it. Because remember, they they had um, Mila Kunis was there. And she, she spoke or she presented. Uh, Mila Kunis was actually born. I think she's Ukrainian, but she was born in the USSR, right? So I thought maybe it would be more. So I'm not really sure um, what, uh, what like was going on. I guess that, you know, it's complicated as far as the, the political messages go, right? It was also pretty last minute. I mean, this thing is rehearsed and planned and um, pretty far in advance. And, um, and so anyway, with uh, what happened with um, uh, W Smith, Mr. William Smith, sorry, man, I got a runny nose. This. I'm pulling a J here in this library. Anyway, <clears throat> what happened with William Smith? So let me just describe what happened. You've, I'm sure everybody's seen it now, but I'm just going to describe what happened because I watched it live. So here's what happened just on the surface. Okay. So, so, um, so Chris Rock came out, right. And he made like a series of jokes. Now that was interesting because he made, uh, there were a lot of jokes throughout the night. I don't know if anybody's talked about this yet. But there were a lot of jokes. One of the themes was this weird, like, um, sort of like sexual, like tension thing that was happening. Um, because one of the, uh, ladies that was co-hosting the show, like kept making references to like how she was single. And then at one point, remember she pulled up Bradley Cooper and a couple of people. And then she, she even mentioned Will Smith and she said, Oh, but I see that, you know, you're available. And she pulled them up on stage. Right. Um, I don't think he went at that. Time. So that was the first thing. Um, oh, there was also in the pre-show interviews, like on the red carpet, they interviewed um, Jamie Lee Curtis. And it wasn't important at the time to me, but then I thought about it later. Uh, the interviewer asked her like, oh, you know, what What about your, you know, and your wonderful mother, um, Janet Lee, what was that like being her daughter or whatever? And she said, um, well, her answer was like, well, it was very personal and I'm not going to share any personal opinions because I was actually her daughter. And that was, I thought that was kind of out of place, but now I see that it kind of goes into this whole theme of like the difference between like personal life and like the airing of the personal life that happened during the show. Right. Um, and then, um, so then anyway, Chris Rock said the thing about, uh, what's her name? Um, Jada Pinkett Smith. He said GI Jane. And then, um, they, they showed them and then here's what happened live. So they showed them and she kind of, she gave us, she went like this and kind of, you know, she didn't like it. And then, but Will Smith was laughing. And then the next thing I know, you heard like a, oh, uh, and then the audio cut and then the video kind of cut. And then next thing was him walking back off the stage. And then they showed him and they showed him yelling and what he was saying, which was keep my wife name out, your, you know, and then, but they caught the audio. And so I was like, it was really off. It caught me off guard, right? Because it was so surprising. And so I was thinking like, I was thinking, is this real? Did this happen? And what I meant by like, is it real? Is, is this like, did I just witness this? Right. Did, did this really just happen? Or like, is there a glitch in the show or something? Cause they weren't like showing it. And then um, when he was saying that, I was like, Oh no, this really happened. So then, so then I watched the, like the far, like in the foreign markets, like they had the audio. Right. So anyway, um, what did you guys think? Um, because I think this is kind of nuanced. Uh, the answer isn't like so simple as you would think. What do you guys think about this? Do you think it's real or fake? What do you think? I saw some of you guys say before. Because my opinion on it is kind of, I don't know, probably a little, it's probably just, you know, oh, here's my hot take. But what I think happened was um, uh, it was real in the sense that uh, you know, Chris Rock came out, he said the thing, and then Will Smith did the thing, and then he got up and then he slapped him, right? Um, it was fake in the sense that I don't think it was organic, right? I don't think it was, um, you know, I don't think this like just happened by accident. I think it was obviously staged, but not staged quite how people are saying it. Um, 
I do think uh, I'm, I'm a little, I'm not sure yet on whether the actual slap was real. Okay. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, like in terms of, even if it was staged, right. Whether he like actually slapped him. I mean, really who cares about this stuff guys, but I just think it's, it's interesting to talk about because of what we're going to talk about. Um, what I think, and then is of course his speech. Right. Um, but, uh, I think, I think, you know, if you're uh, if you think that this was, um, real, it's because, well, it seemed genuine, right? And there was an obvious, like, awkward silence, and then there was the cursing, um, and, you know, and then his speech afterwards, which all indicate, like, oh, this is real. But then the obvious, you know, we obviously, look, we're dealing with actors, okay? So we're obviously going to say, and it's, it's evident now, obviously, you know, especially for a lot of people, because I think a lot of people, you know, catch this. It's like, look, even if this did happen, who's to say that a, you know, uh, a writer, a producer, I don't know, somebody at Rand Corporation didn't didn't plan this for a number of reasons. There are a number of things that came out of this, right? There are a number of political things that come out of it. There are a number of like social issues. Um, there's also the uh, the idea of a distraction from other events that are happening in the world. Um, there's the obvious PR element, which is that, you know, Will Smith has Fresh Prince of Bel-Air coming out. Um, there's the there's the obvious thing about the fact that nobody cares about the Oscars anymore and they need the ratings. And now nobody's talking about how it was low ratings because everybody watched it. Um, and so I think that those are probably all true in a sense, right? Um, and it was interesting to notice that uh, after... After afterwards, right, um, Chris Rock was standing there and he said, you know, after he said uh, it was a joke, right? It was a joke. He said, he said, yeah, I'll hold because he's got an earpiece. So he's, you know, that element alone is nobody really cares about that. But that element alone is like really weird to me because it just shows that he's being directed. He also like, look, you know. Uh, this in terms of like stage combat, like if this were a play is like perfect, right? Because he's up on the stage. He's in a perfect position. He stands there. When Will Smith comes up to him. He has his like face out. You don't really see the slap and you really only see it from behind. And so in stage combat, like if you're doing a play, so I'm not an expert, but I'm, I'm certified and I'm certified in stage combat. And what they do obviously is like when you're going to slap somebody on the stage, they usually will position it. Even in films, they usually present, put a uh, position it where um, if you're the camera, right. And I'm the one getting slapped. There's a guy here who's standing right here. And so all we see is kind of a magic trick. We see the guy's hand go up. So we follow his hand. Right. And then, it, you clap through and usually on a stage, what you'll do is the person will have their hand like this and it kind of is blocked by the other guy so that it makes contact with the hand. Now he didn't do that, right? He made contact with something, which is why I think that that element was real. I think he probably did slap. Him. Um, But the, the reaction, the point is that like when you're doing this, like in a film or stage, you see the hand here and then you see the reaction here, right? And it was kind of sideways. But the point is, like, you see this in a lot of films where the guy gets punched and then his face is to the camera right here. So it doesn't matter where there's a connect. Yeah. Um, all of that is kind of a moot point. I mean, who cares? I think the the main point is um, really what I, we came here to talk about tonight. And that's the idea that you have these actors uh, on a stage. They're in Hollywood. And. Who's to say, because Will Smith's whole thing was, remember, um, I'm an actor and people, you know, I take a lot of abuse because I do this for a living. Um, and then like, I'm a vessel and all this stuff, which was like really, I don't know, scientologically Gnostic or something. What was that about? Right. I'm a vessel. Of course, we hear actors talk about this all the time in terms of like the Stanislavski method, right, where they're kind of a lightning rod or they're, you know, possessed by by entities or forces, right? And they act and they don't really know, you know, what was running through them here. But of course he said, uh, with love. And he said, Denzel told him the thing about, oh, when you're at the top, that's when the devil comes for you. 
who's to say Will Smith wasn't already aware of that in certain ways, right? Um, but I think that uh, my point is that there is no real difference between, um, you know, illusion and reality when it comes to you uh, working in an industry where your whole thing is illusion. The proof of that is obviously the PR, the idea of PR, where um, we know, and you can read this in a bunch of books, right? Yeah. I think Joe um, Joe Esterhaz talks about this in Hollywood Animal. He was a producer. He's the guy who wrote Basic Instinct. How, like, you know, Hollywood will, um, you know, if you have a film coming out, you need publicity, right? So oftentimes the, the lead actor and actress will get together and they'll start dating and they'll even get married because it brings attention to their relationship. And that brings um, attention to the film, which sells the film. Now, Hollywood obviously is not just concerned with box office receipts. That's kind of low down on the totem pole, in my opinion. And um, you may think that's crazy, but the reason for that is um, it's the same with, with anything like it's the same with any, major sort of corporation or center of influence in the country. I mean, we look at like, you know, the TECH companies and we know that, you know, that they even make a Hollywood film about it, right? The social network, which is total BS, which is like, Oh, this guy wrote a, you know, an algo on the, on a window at Harvard and then he sold it. And like, now he's the richest man in the world. Right. And he owns FB um, Zuckerberg. Right. Give me a break, man. Even in the film, right? He sells the thing to um, uh, Teeter Peel, right? Who is, we know, tied in with the alphabet agencies, right? So it's not the money that gives them power. It's the data. It's all that. Hollywood is kind of the same way. I mean, if you want to really dive into this, just go to, obviously, go back to Jay's channel or look at um, Dave McGowan, right? Read Dave McGowan's book with the music industry. Um, and a lot of these things, you know, the, the revelatory uh, thing is that, well, you look at like box office receipts and I've talked about th this before, how one film will carry the, the entire industry or an entire studio for a hundred other films. Right. But, <clears throat> you know, Robert Downey Jr. Talked about this once. Um, uh, after he made it big again, he had his resurgence with um, Iron Man. Uh, he said that somebody offered him um, roles like that he could win Oscars for or whatever. And they said, um, you know, uh, do you want to be in this film? And his response was like, look, man, I'm, I've got like a career again. You think I want to be in like some art movie? You think I want to be in like a, a B movie, like for a first time director, you know, and like flex my acting skills? No, man, I'm not interested in that. I got a career now. I want to be. I want to keep this going. I want to be big. I want to be like in major things that will set the theme. Right. And that to me is pretty, pretty revelatory. Cause it's like, that's what they care about. They care about culture creation and messages and power and reinforcing the things that the establishment wants. Um, and I think a lot is probably going to come out of this particular incident. Right. A lot of it will be, you know, distraction, like, oh, is he going to be sued? Is he, you know, is it, what, what does this say about men and all that, all that stuff is a total distraction, right? The, the main thing is, um, you know, what are, what are the, what is the statement that Hollywood is making about V-I-O-L-E-N-C-E? -E? Um, what does it mean about relationships? What does it mean about like the family unit? Because obviously the whole thing calls into question the idea of the family unit. That's what the whole thing is. That's what their whole argument is about because of the Will and Jada and the C-U-C-K-E-R-Y element that has been very public, right? They've done multiple interviews on this. They went on Ellen or whatever. Um, so I think that's the major uh, thing. Hey, Ellie, what's up? Good to see you. Um, we hope you're doing well. Um, wow, it's really late now. It's good. To, oh, I guess it's really early there. Um, so yeah, so why don't we dive into um something that is uh that deals with what we we're just talking about specifically, and that is I didn't mean to go back to Shakespeare, you guys. Um, but 
kind of can't help it because um, because there's one uh, particular passage in one of his plays that is quoted all the time. Um, and it deals specifically with what we just saw last night. Um, also, obviously, Denzel was there for playing Macbeth, and there's a lot of Shakespeare talk now, so we might as well go into this. So this is um, a play I've mentioned before, and it's actually one of my least favorite Shakespearean plays. It's a comedy. It's As You Like It, um, which actually also, I just realized this, deals with uh, the idea of T-R-A-N-Z and cross uh, dross cressing as part of the plot. Um, and that may play into what we've just been discussing, right? So interesting. Um, so why don't we read this, just this one passage. I'm not going to tell you what the play is about besides that, besides that, but let's just read this one passage. Um, it's a famous, uh, monologue act two, scene seven, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewing and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like, like uh, small, like uh, creeping like snail, unwilling to go to school. And then the lover. Sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even at the common at the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, the spectacles on nose and pouch on side. Um, his youthful hose, well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again toward childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. It's a really famous speech. I'm sure you guys have heard it or you've heard um, parts of it, right? Especially the last part and the first part, right? And obviously we're talking about the seven stages of man. This is like the seven pillars of wisdom, right? T.E. Lawrence. Um, it's also like it's supposed to mimic the idea of the um, the riddle of the Sphinx, right? That... Um, that Oedipus solves in the Sophoclean play. But aside from the seven ages, right, let's talk about this one part. Um, so the lover, and let's see how relevant this is. So, so let me go back just from the beginning, and then I'm going to stop at that part. All the world's a stage, yes? So the metaphor here is that the stage is the, the I guess, what do you call that? The, um, what's the word? The... Uh, what's the word? Synchronicity, not uh, symbolism. Um, the oh, uh, you guys, what do you call it when um, a small thing stands for a larger thing in the in the play or the text? Um, it occurs in Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Remember how they have like the toy set, and then there's like the little mountain, um, and that stands for something bigger. Um, in, in the play, we call it um, not syncretism. It's uh, uh, not it's not a microcosm. It's there's a literary term for it. Okay, I'll come up with it later. Anyway, the world is yes. Well, the world is the microcosm for the macrocosm. I mean, the stage is the microcosm for the macrocosm of the world, right? So all of the events in the world uh, take place. Um, in a smaller, like, uh, you know, on a smaller scale on the stage. Yes. And, you know, Shakespeare is the perfect example of this because um, he covers the entire like breadth of, you know, human emotion and relationships and all the, you know, war and peace and death, all this stuff. Right. Um, but uh, what else though? What, how does this apply to us? Right. Because it kind of goes the opposite way here. It's like, 
instead of the stage being the world, what we saw kind of last night is that like the world, right, is like where the staged things take place in a sense, right? Simulacrum. Thank you, Stephen. Yes. Excellent. Um, so yeah, so it's like the idea that the Z man was going to win best actor or whatever is like a perfect example of this. So there's, there's the line between illusion and reality is like blurred purposefully so that the average person there is no difference, even though in there, when they talk to each other, they'll say like, oh, no, man, no, that's real. But that's not right. Oh, because it's Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, yeah, they're getting awards for acting. Yes. And these guys are actors like in their life. But this particular thing is real. Maybe it is, but it's, you know, it's very doubtful considering their whole city, their whole like reason for being is illusion. Yes. So he says all the men and women merely players, right? And the player is the actor, but it's also the player, like the, it's like Grimes, right? The player of games. We're all like, oh, we're all like maybe pawns on this grand chessboard. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts. That's true. We've talked about the idea of the, um, the persona, right. And how we wear, you know, certain like archetypal masks when we are in certain situations in our life. And that goes back to literally back to Greek drama, right. Wearing the, the mask in the amphitheater to, as part of a religious, a religious ritual, right. It's part of a Bacchic rite. You're putting on a play, but you're also doing a religious ritual. Um, uh, his acts being seven ages. Okay. And then he talks about the infant, um, Mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Okay. The schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face. Um, okay, here we go. And then the lover sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. Then a soldier full of strange oaths and bearded like the part, jealous in honor and sudden in, and quick in quarrel. Seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. That right there, I think, perfectly describes the events of last night, right? I mean, we saw those few ages occur right there in the span of like a few minutes. And I'm not saying that that is I'm, – I'm, what I'm saying is that Shakespeare perfectly captures that, right? So we have the lover, yes, uh, the husband, um sighing like furnace, right? So um, the, the heat of the moment, a woeful ballad made to his mistress eyebrow. She literally uh, gave him the eyebrow when um, Rock said that to her, right? She literally turned and gave her husband the eyebrow. Um, you can imagine a sigh, right? And then it's, then what did he become? He became a soldier, right? Uh, full of strange oaths. He was swearing, he was swearing on camera, right? Um, jealous in honor and sudden and quick in quarrel. I mean, was that not quick? Was the quarrel not, not quick? Seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth, the bubble reputation. I mean, how is that not, how is what we witness not the bubble reputation? I mean, look at the, the, uh, the actual ceremony is in a bubble, right? It's in the Dolby theater and it's, it's like in a bubble. Um, the stage is almost like a bubble, right? They also have like a difference between the main people and then the, the cheap seats up in the top. Yes. And it's all like, it's, they tried to keep it. Or they tried to keep it in a bubble of themselves. They're like, their whole thing is insular. Right. And then it gets out to the public by design, I'm sure. Um, but uh, let's see, um, even in the cannon's mouth. So the cannon's mouth for the soldier, a, lit a literal can um, cannon. But for here, the cannon, the opening of the cannon is like the camera. It's like the camera's mouth, right? And that, you know, we can say that that sort of, I don't know, analysis might be vindicated by his response when he won the award later, right? So he's in the cannon's mouth 
we are seeing him through the camera. And then he knows he's going to face a whole bunch of criticism. And in the speech, when he won, he said, you know, he talked about like, I hope they invite me back. I'm, you know, it's obvious like there's going to be a lot of blowback for this. Now that's that interpretation is like, can, can apply whether it's real or it's staged. Yes. Because regardless those are the things that are going to come out of it. And if it's staged and the whole thing is, you know, set up, then they've seen those, those sort of outcomes. Now, yes, these people are always like tone deaf and they're always, um, you know, they have like, they're, they, they just have no idea about the, you know, normal, regular person out there, or if we even care. Um, and by care, what I mean is like, we care enough to look at what happened and like to analyze it in this sort of sense, but I wouldn't certainly wouldn't go about analyzing it in like a, Oh, you know, he was wrong for doing that. Or like, I mean that, that who cares about that? That's like level one of where everyone else is. Yes. Um, all of that can go out the window. I like what um, Mixky said, shout out to Kang Mixky um, earlier today. Uh, I think in one of the chats, which was like, look, man, who cares about this? Um, you know, don't let it distract you from the um, G R E A T R E S E T thing that's going on, which is the real slap in the face, right? The the real, um, you know, the the real shutdown of the world, right? This is just like it's just theater, yes. So, um, I would say, I mean, that's the only, that's the only part I wanted to analyze because I thought it was, I immediately thought of that speech. Um, I was going to talk also about the um, opening to Henry V because it's kind of relevant to this um, because it talks about uh, the world being staged. Yes. Um, so I guess we could kind of look at that for a second. I don't want to go too deep into it, um, but uh, it, again, it's the idea of the, the world and the world is a stage um, and the idea that, you know, uh, we're all sort of, we can be unwitting players in the drama of the, um, you know, the higher ups or the controllers or really anyone. Yes. I mean, even the normal regular person living his life can sort of be an unwitting pawn to uh, controlling events. Um, but we might as well look at this a little bit. This is the prologue to um, Henry V which we discussed before I put a link in the um, in the description to the other analysis of Henry V. We did the St. Crispin's Day speech. So we might as well read the beginning to this. Um, so this is the prologue to the play. And it's interesting because it begins with um, basically a Greek chorus. Speaking of Sophocles, right? It's basically a chorus. The, the guy's name is, you know, he's a chorus. So the idea of the chorus in drama is, you know, you have this like third party that comes to speak directly to the audience and to sort of guide us into the events. Um, and he says, the chorus says, uh, he starts off with the letter O. We've talked about how the letter O in, in Elizabethan or in Shakespearean drama is an important um, letter because it's a, it's the only single uh, letter word in Shakespeare that, um, can symbolize something um, so big because it's like the yawning of the soul. And he starts off, oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Them should the warlike Henry, like himself, assume the port of Mars. And at his heels, leashed in the hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. But pardon gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that hath dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden O oh, the very casks that did affright the air at Agincourt? Oh, pardon, since a crooked figure may assent, uh, may attest in little place a million, and let us ciphers to this great account on your imaginary forces work. 
right? So what he's saying here is, look, man, um, use your, um, use your, you know, suspend your disbelief. We're on a stage. We're watching a stage. But forgive us if um, this, you know, doesn't do justice to the actual events, right? Um, and he's talking specifically about the court, the Asian court. You said, read an AJ voice. Okay, I'll, that's the next part. He says, um, oh, and also ciphers to this great account. A cipher to a great account uh, would indicate that we are supposed to decode the events, right? We're supposed to watch the events and decode them for symbolism and apply them to our own worldview and to meaning, right? He says, um, suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies whose hind uprear it in abutting fronts, the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Pierce out our imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. Tis our thoughts that now must deck our kings. Carry them here and there, jumping over times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. Right, so um, I think that, you know, remember, he's invoking the muse here. He's invoking the muse, folks. He's invoking the muse, which uh, DPH talked about earlier tonight, uh, the idea of the muse. Uh, remember that the muse, oh, the book front just covers came off my book. Um, the idea of the muse, right, being uh, almost, you know, it's an otherworldly, uh, a demon, right, a demon spirit that comes and whispers in the poet's ear to speak, right? It inspires him. It breathes life into him. And so what he's saying here is, oh, for a muse of fire, this is, that is like the Holy Spirit, right? He's saying that would ascend, that's the last uh, word in the line, oh, for a muse of fire that would ascend. Ascend is the end of the line because it's going up into a climax, right? The brightest heaven of invention. So he's saying, wow, if, if only we had, um, if only I had the inspiration of, um, is he saying the, an angel, right? So that I could, um, talk to you about bigger things and set the scene for like these swelling acts, he later says, right? Um, but all we have here, right, is we for a kingdom, we've got a stage. We've got princes to act and monarchies to behold the swelling scene. Well, isn't that life? I mean, isn't that what we see every day, especially the word monarch here, right? Um, isn't that what we see? We see these princes acting, Yes, we're seeing that right now, literally. Yes, he's not a prince, but he is, in a way, right? He's a, I don't know, a puppet prince who's been put there, the Z-Man. He's literally an actor. He's literally an actor, you guys. The swelling scene. The scene swells with drama and all the energy we put into it. It swells literally with uh, guns and butter and weapons, right? Um, that should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, assuming the port of Mars, right, is martial. Mars, martial, um, war. Yes, he's taking on the mantle of war. And at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. That's right. So even Shakespeare is saying here, and he's referring back to the 1400s, right, that what follows on the heels of war, well, um, Famine, sword, and fire, right? It never really changes, does it? Um, and uh, I think the, the the great tragedy, right, is the fact that, you know, these things occur and people get sucked into them and it's totally unnecessary. Sometimes it's necessary, but for the most part, it gets it's it's unnecessary and it just 
who does it swell? The princes and the monarchies, right? And the, you know, principalities. Um, so I guess it's our duty to, um, like ciphers, right? Like, uh, like ciphers to decode the events and to form a, you know, an, ac an accurate um, insight into the events and what's happened and what's happening and what will happen. So <laughs> that's all I got for Shakespeare tonight. I don't know about you guys, but, um, you know, I, I just, whenever these things occur, you know, I'm just, I'm never, I just, I'm, I'm never surprised. Um, you can be affected by them, right? You can be at some point. Um, it's like, it's like, I think Jeff said, right. Um, you know, when you, when you stare into the abyss too long, right. Well, it uh, 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 stares back. Yes. Um, so uh, yes, I think that that is, um, I think that's bound to be the case, right? I mean, AJ talks about this all the time. I do this for you. I ask for this, right? You know, but in our in our own lives, you know, you you gotta obviously you gotta temper what you do and and try and find uh, positive alternatives and stuff. But you know, um, to the people also who say like, no man, you know, I don't need to be looking at any of the stuff or what's going on in the world. I'm just trying to you know, be happy. Well, yeah, that's, that's their prerogative, but, um, you know, truth is hard. It's, it's harsh. Yes. And yes, there's a lot of great light literature, but, um, the dark stuff is, I guess, maybe unfortunately the stuff that, um, we get, a, we glean a lot of truth from, right? How Streamlabs coming? Um, yes, yeah, I'm trying. I keep trying. You guys, it's really hard. I don't know if you guys, if you're watching this and you have a Streamlabs, you're probably like, yeah, idiot. It's really easy. But um, for me, I look at it and I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's really hard to set up. Um, so, you know, putting it all together and like, you know, I don't know anything about any of that. So, yeah, it's pretty hard. It'd be great if it was just like, bam, turn it on. There you go. You drag a screen or whatever, but it's not really like that. Um, so I need to educate myself as far as that goes. Um, yeah, shouts out to all of our friends out there. Thank you, Ellie, for dropping in. We really appreciate it. And uh, we love you and we're all, you know, praying for you um, and your family. Um, and let's see, who else? We got great news, like a bunch of our friends, right? Um, we've got... Uh, Block Party Vintage had some good news recently. Uh, our homie uh, Mixkey, um, ADH is going to have some uh, a good thing happening um, this summer, and of course Jerry, our our brother Jerry has some great news, and it's especially great news because um, I think it's been a long time coming. It's been heavy, so um, shouts out to him. Yes, yeah, this this month is really rolling by, you guys. Um, Pretty soon it'll be April, and April is the cruelest month. Breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Yeah, we should do a T.S. Eliot Wasteland analysis on the first day of April. That might be good. That, that could be something we could do because then we could get into some more modern literature. And the wasteland is such a huge... It's not huge, but it's complex and thick. And probably everybody here has at least read or heard of The Wasteland. And although published in like 1922, it's still the thing that sets the theme for now. Oh, 22. Yeah, we can do a 100-year thing with that, right? Um, and the fragmentation, right, the fragmentation of the world, um, especially occurring, not starting with, but especially occurring um, you know, during uh, the height of modernity, right, which is like, I guess, the Great War, right, and post-war. I mean, World War I literally fracturing um, Europe, right, um, digging into the earth, um, scarring the land with, with trenches, and then the fracturing of the minds of all the people that came out of it, resulting in the lost generation. That's what the poem is about. So we should... Um, we should definitely dive into that. I think it would be good. Of course, the problem with um, the wasteland is 
that one of the main elements of T.S. Eliot's Wasteland is that it is specifically um, it's elliptical and it's allegorical and the allusions in the poem run really deep. Uh, every line has one or multiple allusions to something else. Um, and that is part of the point. A lot of it's in uh, other languages. And uh, I mean, the, the, the epigraph to the poem, I think is, um, you know, it's like the Sibyl, Nam Sibylam. Um, there's a, there's a part from Dante's Inferno. There's like, there's Goethe. There's all kinds of stuff. It has the Upanishads, right? Shanti, 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 which is in um, Children of Men. Remember that part in the movie Children of Men? Shanti, 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 which means um, equates to the peace which passeth understanding. Um, but the point is that it is the fragmentation, the babbling, right? The 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 post Tower of Babel world, and we'll see with we'll see wh whether we agree with that or not with uh, the worldview presented by T.S. Eliot. But but one cannot deny that T.S. Eliot's worldview is one that certainly became the stand. That's the status quo. It, it's the it is the work of literature that established the status quo for the uh, global post world war one modern world. And it still um, has its effects and currents in the world we live in today. Um, I'm not saying that it started that, right. I mean, that we could talk about the enlightenment, but it certainly uh, get, it certainly is a major piece on that. It's like, it's the modern it's the modern work of literature. It's, it's huge. It, it's monolithic almost. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we could talk about that. Uh, what else, what else can we talk about in the future? You guys, I've been thinking over the past week about, you know, what we can, what works of literature we can discuss. Um, and there's no shortage, obviously we can like, you know, give me ideas and we can go into pretty much um, anything. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, pretty, you know, I'm, I'm widely read and knowledgeable, knowledgeable, obviously about, um, not obviously, but knowledgeable about, a, you know, a good scope of literature. Some things that people have recommended, I haven't read and that's who can read everything, right? Somebody I think recommended, um, somebody recommended Norman Mailer recently. And then somebody else recommended like Philip Roth. And I've never read Norman Mailer or Philip Roth. I've purposely avoided them. Um, for one, because I don't, I usually try to avoid fiction. Like if I, if I go into a work of fiction or I analyze fiction, it it's for a, a specific reason. Um, Cause I, I just try, I tend to avoid it. Um, someone told me Vonnegut is bad. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we get, it's funny. Some, it's funny to bring up Vonnegut, uh, Stephen, uh, because um, if you guys ever seen back to school, 1986, uh, Rodney Dangerfield, have you ever seen that? Remember, he has a cameo in the film, which is weird uh, because um, what's his name? Thornton Mellon <laughs> um, is trying to like get an A in the woman's English class in her literature class. And uh, he like has to do a paper on, on Kurt Vonnegut. So he hires Kurt Vonnegut to be the to be the tutor to help him write it. And then he turns it in and like and she's like, um, no, Kurt, this is this doesn't get it at all, even though Vonnegut himself wrote the analysis, but he shows up in the film. Oh, another a couple of things about that film, just random. Uh, one, the first thing that she quotes when he first meets her in the class is um, Ulysses by uh, James Joyce. Shout out to Crispy. And, uh, you know, she's doing the famous yes, yes, I told you yes speech from Ulysses. And then later she quotes um, Dylan Thomas, "Do not go gentle into that good night." Have we done Dylan Thomas? We've we've did, we've covered Dylan Thomas a little bit, but I don't know if we did. Do not go gentle into that good night. We should cover that because Dylan Thomas is my um, second favorite poet. I love Dylan Thomas. Um, but the other thing is that there's a scene in Back to School. You guys will love this. There's a scene in Back to School where he goes like to a science lab, and there's like they're doing like. Uh, experiments on like, you know, champs or whatever. And he specifically says um, who he says, like, who should I call to um, uh, like the guy says, can you help with the experiment? He says, who should I call to help me with this? Um, 
Rand, I can call Rand Corporation, um, Brookings Institute. He, he drops both names. And I think DARPA is part of it, too. I mean, Jay talked about how DARPA is in the movie um, Real Genius with Val Kilmer. But, you know, it, I don't know. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> yes, Jeff. Yes. Um, yeah. Have you ever, you guys ever been to uh, uh, Dangerfield's Comedy Club in New York? Um, yeah, interesting. Um, except his name is D-A-N. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's not all I got, guys. Um, it's almost midnight. So look, thank you for dropping by. We're going to get back into the swing of things. Uh, we've been out for, you know, a, a few days now, a week um, with stuff. But we're going to get back into it and, you know, dive back into some literature because there's a lot happening. So thank you for being here. Thank you to my friends and my, um, of course, my uh, wonderful mods and my my homies. Um, I love you guys. Um, shout out to everybody out there doing good, positive stuff. Um, I pray for uh, all my friends and family um, and my my homies out there um, who are in need. And uh, you know, let's uh, what can we say? Right, got to keep living, you guys. Got to keep living. L-I-V-I-N. All right, y'all. Love you. Peace.